on this Wednesday night. One thing I could say for sure, the one thing he wasn't doing is endangering China's national security. New insight into the work of one of the Canadians detained in China. Michael Kovrig's boss speaks exclusively to CBC about the work he was doing and the message China is sending to the world. When we last left our hero, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. In Saudi Arabia, Netflix silences a critic of the regime. But does the comic have the last laugh? There's a lot there, it's a big effect, and it's so simple. And if you have trouble remembering things, stop writing them down and start <laughs> drawing instead. New research may just bring out your inner artist. This is The National. Twenty-three days and counting, that's how long China's spy agency has been holding Canadians Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaver in detention. The two men haven't been formally charged, haven't been given access to lawyers, and they're not even allowed to contact family or loved ones. Today, the employer of one of the men is speaking out exclusively to CBC News, telling Katie Simpson that China is making a major mistake. A new voice is publicly coming to Michael Kovrig's defense, demanding Chinese authorities release the Canadian man immediately. I'm focused on getting him out, and one thing I could say for sure, the one thing he wasn't doing is endangering China's national security. Robert Malley is Kovrig's boss at the International Crisis Group. In his first broadcast interview since the arrest, he is dismissing Chinese allegations against Kovrig while fiercely defending his work at the well-respected think tank. The latest project he was doing was on North Korea and looking at what could be done to uh, prevent a war on the Korean Peninsula. Again, an objective that we assume China shares. Like all ICG employees, Mali says Kovrig was keeping Chinese authorities up to date on his research reports in an effort to avoid looking suspicious. The point is not to harm Chinese interests, but to see what China could do and what others could do uh, to promote uh, a more peaceful resolution of the, of the North Korean crisis. Kovrig is one of two Canadians accused of endangering Chinese national security. He and entrepreneur Michael Spaver were detained separately in December in what is widely seen as retribution for Canada's arrest of Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou. Since the arrests, Mali says business leaders have been asking him whether it's safe to travel to China. He's not offering any advice, but says China's actions send the wrong message to investors. You're going to chill people from coming, business people, academics, members of the of think tank community, ordinary citizens who may think of going to China and who will think, if this could happen to someone like Michael, with all the connections he has, what does it mean for me? The only way to repair some of that damage, Mali says, is to release Kovrig now. I don't know that something like this ever completely disappears from people's memories, but uh, it certainly would be a huge step forward. And for the sake of Michael. Katie joins us now from Ottawa. Katie, are there any updates on Michael Kovrig's condition right now? There's no fresh information about how Michael Kovrig or Michael Spaver are doing at this point. Mally confirmed Kovrig's had just the one consular visit so far, and right now he's only expected to get one consular visit per month for as long as he's being detained. Canada's ambassador to China, John McCallum, is pushing for more access to both men, and on Twitter he said his top priority for 2019 is to secure their release. Okay, and despite these arrests, detentions, I, I gather there's a group of parliamentarians actually going to China this week. That's right, Rosie. There will be four MPs and two senators heading to China on Saturday. It's a mix of liberals and conservatives as part of the Canada-China Legislative Association. The visit was planned long ago, well before Canada-China tensions flared. And it's still going ahead, even though we've seen other parliamentarians, including Tourism Minister Melanie Jolie, postpone planned trips because of what's going on. At this point, it's unclear if the MPs or the senators will bring up the consular cases with the Chinese, uh, but there is no doubt this dispute will most certainly overshadow the trip. Rosie. Okay, Katie Simpson in Ottawa tonight. Thanks, Katie. Thanks. And a development today in another diplomatic tussle, this one between Russia and the U.S. Moscow says it has given consular access to Paul Whelan, the American man born in Canada who was mysteriously arrested. We've made clear to the Russians our expectation uh, that we will learn more about the charges uh, come to understand 
um, what it is he's been accused of, and if uh, the detention is not appropriate, uh, we will demand his immediate return. The former U.S. Marine Staff Sergeant was arrested in Moscow last Friday by the FSB on suspicion of carrying out an act of espionage. Today, the U.S. ambassador to Russia met with Whalen at the notorious Lafortova prison and afterwards spoke to his family by phone. I don't think there's any chance that he was a spy. His twin brother in Toronto rejects any notion that he was gathering intelligence. He was visiting Moscow for a wedding for a friend and helping his friend because Paul had been to Russia before and could navigate Moscow and the sites. And so he was helping to acquire some of the American uh, tourists around uh, who are part of the wedding party. Whalen was born in Ottawa and Global Affairs Canada says today that consular officials are aware that a Canadian citizen has been arrested in Russia. He faces up to 20 years in prison if he's found guilty. Meanwhile, anticipation is building for the reopening of a special reunification program, a chance for immigrant families to bring parents and grandparents here to Canada. Ottawa has tried and failed to iron out the kinks before, now adopting a first-come, first-serve process online. As Evan Dyer tells us, many hope that's an improvement. Uzma Jalal has been trying to bring her parents from Bangladesh since 2011. My entire application package was sent back to me. And the reason which was stated by IRCC is that uh, they're putting a halt on, um, on accepting new applications uh, because of the backlog. That backlog reached 167,000 that year, so the program shut down till 2014 when Jalal applied again, only to be refused again, and the next year. They said it was a first come, first serve, and they reached the 5,000 apparently cap on the very first day in about few hours. The same thing happened again in 2016, but that year Immigration Minister Ahmed Hussein decided to change the system which benefited those who could get their applications in fastest. The previous system included uh, uh, an unfair uh, uh, characteristic that if you lived, if your postal code was closer to the processing center you would have better odds than the next person. Now there would be a lottery, but the change left Jalal and many others feeling burned. I didn't find it fair because my, my friends or my neighbors who came after me, they just applied for their parents and the very first time their application was picked. After receiving a torrent of angry mail, the department scrapped the lottery and on New Year's Eve tweeted that a new program will start taking applications later this month, 20,000 this year, double the number accepted in 2017. The lottery system, that is the worst because it's not based on merit. The a lot of people who meet the criteria and you are picking them randomly. Then you said, oh, you know, that was wrong. So we are going back to a new system. It is not a new system. It's the old system you're introducing again. And I'm pretty much sure that in the future, someone will come and will say, that is also not working. The application backlog has been reduced by more than 80% from its peak under the last government, and Jalal's application for her parents was finally accepted in 2018 after seven years. It'll probably still take a year or two before they're cleared to come to Canada. That's much faster than before, but still can't come soon enough, says Jalal. She's their only surviving child, and she says she needs their help to raise her own four children. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, if today was any indication, 2019 is going to be wilder than ever in Donald Trump's Washington. The drama surrounding and created by the U.S. president reached a fever pitch on this first working day of the new year. The reasons, almost too many to count. But they include a blistering new attack by a fellow Republican, a pretty strange White House stunt, and a key meeting with a view to ending the partial shutdown of the U.S. government. But on that, as Paul Hunter reports... No deal. How long are you willing to keep the government shut down? In order to get as long as it takes. And with that, Donald Trump underlined he's in no hurry to end the now nearly two-week-old U.S. government shutdown. Hundreds of thousands of government workers are now unpaid. Various government institutions shut down. All because Trump won't sign off on paying for them unless Democrats sign off on his long-promised border wall with Mexico. Later, after a private meeting on it with Trump, senior Democrats suggested there seems no way out. I asked him directly. I said, Mr. President, give me one good reason why you should continue your shutdown of the, of the eight cabinet departments while we are debating our differences on homeland security. He could not give a good answer. 
And so the apparent chaos grows. Consider, Trump has yet to replace seven cabinet-level officials who've lately up and quit or been fired. I think I would have been a good general, but who knows? At his first lengthy to-and-fro with reporters of 2019, he laid in front of them this poster, but gave no explanation, not a word. He took personal credit for lower gasoline prices, labeled Syria nothing more than sand and death, and highlighted how he spent Christmas. It was all by myself in the White House. It's a big, big house, except for all the guys out on the lawn with machine guns, nicest machine guns I've ever seen. And then there's Mitt Romney, 2012 Republican presidential nominee, now a newly elected senator for Utah, today trashing Trump in an op-ed. Trump's conduct, he writes, is evidence that the president has not risen to the mantle of the office, later suggesting he's by no means ready to back Trump for re-election. Uh, and I haven't decided who I'm going to endorse in 2020. I'm going to wait and see what the alternatives are. Even Democratic strategists seem taken aback by Romney's step. We are going through a very difficult time in the United States. You know, we are very likely going to have a constitutional crisis in the next 12 months, the next 18 months. Uh, it is going to be a time for people to show profiles and courage. I hope that that's what Mitt Romney was doing. On top of that, tomorrow, Democrats officially take control of the House of Representatives. Think the first two years of this presidency have been complicated for Trump. Now comes the hard part. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Now, tomorrow, Paul will be covering the swearing in of the new Congress. And beyond familiar faces like Mitt Romney's, there are several newcomers to watch for. Take Sharice Davids, a fighter, literally. Davids is an ex mixed martial arts competitor and attorney. And the incoming House Democrat also happens to be one of the first indigenous women elected to Congress. Another Democrat to watch, Ilhan Omar. Even before her first day, she's convinced Democrats to overturn the ban on wearing headwear in Congress. She's a refugee, hailed as a trailblazer, also attacked by critics for her stance against Israel. Then, on the other side, there's Marsha Blackburn. She was a conservative firebrand in the House. This will be her first stint in the Senate. She could also become the first Republican woman to serve on the Senate Judiciary Committee. For a president dogged by investigations, that would make her a key ally. For some, Saudi Arabia's apparent murder of the journalist and political exile Jamal Khashoggi presented a challenge for countries and companies. Which does it value more, free speech and human rights, or good relations with a rich, powerful player in the Middle East? Now, the media giant Netflix is facing that dilemma. In Saudi Arabia, it pulled an episode of a series by the comedian Hassan Minhaj. And as Deanna Sumanag Johnson explains, that decision has sparked outrage. Now, when we last left our hero, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, the Saudis were struggling to explain the disappearance of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Comedian Hassan Minhaj is no stranger to offending authorities. And it blows my mind that it took the killing of a Washington Post journalist for everyone to go, oh, I guess he's really not a reformer. Meanwhile. But in Saudi Arabia, saying something like this is more than risque. It's against the law. Saudi authorities demanded that Netflix pull the offending episode from its service, and the streaming giant complied, drawing the ire of human rights advocates and people on social media, some of whom threatened to cancel their Netflix accounts. For Karen Atia, who was Jamal Khashoggi's editor at the Washington Post, it's both personal and a matter of principle. I was really grateful, actually, for uh, them giving attention to Jamal's case and on, on Saudi Arabia. For Netflix, in, in a lot of ways, I mean, the outrage is coming from the sense that uh, not only, you know, American businesses, but even our own president is basically caving to Saudi Arabia's demands. A statement from Netflix said, we strongly support artistic freedom worldwide and removed this episode only in Saudi Arabia after we had received a valid legal demand from the government and to comply with local law. Involve human rights, it might involve... And this TV and streaming well. analyst but thinks the outrage against Netflix is misplaced. Where they are at the end of the day running a business. Uh, the Middle East is going to be an important growth market for them and they have to respect uh, local culture. They can't take a stand against everything. Still many wonder if this is an indicator of how Netflix and other streaming platforms will deal when other governments question their global content. 
In the meantime, the controversial episode is still available on YouTube, even in Saudi Arabia, prompting Hassan Minaj to tweet, Clearly, the best way to stop people from watching something is to ban it, make it trend online, and then leave it up on YouTube. Yemen was filing the civil war. The Houthi rebels... Minaj also asked his followers to donate money to war-ravaged Yemen, another subject of his anti-Saudi routine. Deanna Sumanak-Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. You can find Netflix in nearly every country, but it's faced multiple challenges around censorship, including in some of the world's most important markets. Netflix has gone big in India, and there's been pushback against provocative shows like Sacred Games, which prompted politicians to launch lawsuits. In Indonesia, it was banned until it agreed to censor violent and racy content. As for the biggest untapped market of all, China, Netflix is shut out. How long can happiness realistically last, anyhow? The company recently said it had no plans to enter the country, citing the unpredictable regulation, but you can find some Netflix shows like Black Mirror and Mindhunter there, licensed to local distributors. We're watching several other developing stories live on The National tonight, including a heartbreaking evening for Team Canada at the World Juniors. Works in, drop, shoot, score! Tony Utenet, overtime winner! So Finland scored the winning goal of the quarterfinal game in overtime, beating Canada 2-1, and that means for the first time Canada will not reach the podium at a World Juniors played on home soil, even though Fans uh, chanted goalie Michael DiPietro's name to show their support for his performance tonight, even in a loss. The Canucks prospect stopped 32 of 34 shots and was named player of the game for Canada. And throughout the night, we'll keep a close eye on Newfoundland. Much of the province has been battered by a second winter storm with up to 50 centimeters, almost two feet of snow. With the wind, some roads weren't even safe for snow plows. Many businesses and schools were closed. Many flights were canceled or delayed. A blizzard warning is still in effect for St. John's and surrounding areas. And in Calgary, a man in his 60s was killed after slipping on an icy sidewalk. It happened around 11.30 last night. First responders found him on the ground with trauma to his head. He was taken to hospital. The department head of the emergency medicine in Calgary says the city has more falls proportionally than other cities. The winter cycle of freezing and thawing may be partly to blame. And still ahead on The National, a Toronto-based company using artificial intelligence to help you improve your conversation skills in another language. Plus, it was a deal that seemed too good to be true. First-class air tickets sold at a steep discount, but we'll check in with one of the lucky purchasers. None of them were us, so uh, <laughs> you may want to trade in those to-do lists for sketches, how drawing can actually improve your memory. I get carried away with the details and the... It, it's a, a process that leads somewhere. Whereas writing, you're just writing it down. It's been said a picture is worth a thousand words, and this might be more true than we actually realize, especially when it comes to our thinking and memory. There's a trick that science says works that will help you retain information better than some other techniques, no matter your age. Our health reporter, Christine Birak, explains how you can draw from your memory. We can all draw, maybe not as well as Diana Robson here, but when it comes to your memory, you might want to grab a pencil. I get carried away with the details and the, it, it's a, a process that leads somewhere, whereas writing, you're just writing it down. She's right. A new study says drawing can light up parts of the brain that writing just doesn't. Using a series of short tests, researchers found drawing can help you remember new information significantly better than repeatedly writing it, picturing something in your mind, or even looking at images of it. When you're drawing, you're basically thinking about the way something looks, so that's gonna use parts of the brain that are involved in visual processing. Okay, all right, so okay. we're gonna start the experiment now. All right, I'm ready. Okay. To better understand it, we did a short test, drawing versus writing. Random words appear, and you have 40 seconds to write it repeatedly 
or draw a picture of it. Clearly, I'm no artist. You drew this and you also drew this. In the end, I'd recalled twice the number of words I drew over the written ones. I can see how there's a real difference in the way I'm processing that information for yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. The drawing effect also worked equally as well for participants over the age of 65. And early results show drawing can also help dementia patients retain new information. What we think is that drawing is, um, involves a lot of this visual perceptual processing, so it's recruiting these posterior regions here. As we age, critical brain structures involved in retaining memory deteriorate, including our frontal and temporal lobes. But visual spatial processing is done in the back, in the occipital lobe. This area remains mostly intact during normal aging. Even if their drawings were, you know, virtually incomprehensible, they're, they're still showing this effect. This neuropsychologist now wants to figure out how to use this information, whether it's a grocery or to-do list. There's a lot there, it's a big effect, and it's so simple. Um, we will figure out how to apply it. Robson helps seniors get creative and says this year she might change the way she pens her New Year's resolutions. I might try making images for those resolutions. Yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Well, a recent memory here, an update on a story we brought you just a few weeks ago. Hundreds of call center employees in Nova Scotia all abruptly let go just before the holidays. They were back on the phones today. We are 100% committed in making this way better than it has been before. So I appreciate all of your patience for that. A promising pep talk welcomed by hundreds of Cape Bretoners who were blindsided back in December. Three weeks before Christmas, Servicom, a call center company, shut down. 600 jobs apparently gone. It's disgusting because you know what? When you come to a place and you have your faith in somebody, whatever, and they turn around and tell you that the place is closing and you no longer have work, how are you supposed to take care of your family? No Christmas now. I'm owed over $1,500. I'm not going to get 500 people going to apply for EI at the same time. Who's going to get it before Christmas? No one knows any of this. Then, days before Christmas, a U.S. businessman swooped in buying the call center for one and a half million dollars at auction. His plan wasn't just to keep all the former employees, but get them started again as soon as possible. Today, 250 workers returned with more expected in the next few weeks. And right now, there's a muted sense of relief. Yeah, it was definitely a, a roller coaster of emotions. Um, more, more so happy and just excited to get back and do good at what I'm doing. And though the building still has Servicom's name on it, it is now the Sydney Call Centre, supporting U.S. Telecom, AT&T, and GM's OnStar service. Still to come on The National, he won the hearts of viewers as the accident-prone stuntman Super Dave. We'll look back on the life of actor and comedian Bob Einstein. And it was supposed to save lives, but its high price tag meant a short market life. The problem is, is also that people like me and Michael, we never have anything to say about pricing. You know, by the time that there's a pricing, we are, we are gone already. Welcome back. Tonight, we are giving you another look at a story we brought you last year. It takes you behind the scenes of a Canadian medical breakthrough, though it doesn't have a happy ending. The drug, called Glybera, was developed to treat a rare, often debilitating genetic disorder. The team behind it believed it would save lives, but patients who want it can't get it. Here's Kelly Crow once again on the million-dollar medicine that just couldn't make it to market. These are some of the last remaining vials of what was a life-changing drug, a made-in-Canada medical breakthrough called Glybera. It was the world's first gene therapy, the first drug on the market that could fix a faulty gene. It offered new hope for people who suffer from a rare and potentially deadly genetic disorder. It was a turning point in my life. Cynthia Turcott was born with a genetic mutation called lipoprotein lipase deficiency, or LPLD. Her blood becomes thick with fat particles, triggering painful and dangerous attacks of pancreatitis. 
there was no treatment before Glybera. But after just two years on the market, Glybera is gone. How did you feel about that? Disappointed, of course. I would like to have seen this go all the way and seen this uh, uh, bring benefit to patients everywhere in the world. But it didn't. This is the story of an unsung Canadian scientific achievement, a world first, ultimately defeated by the harsh realities of the pharmaceutical industry. The Glybera story started more than 30 years ago in a publicly funded laboratory at the University of British Columbia. In the early days of gene research, Dr. Michael Hayden was a pioneer determined to find a cure for patients suffering unbearable abdominal pain. Each time going back to the patient and hearing their stories, you, that just keeps you going. You just have to go to a clinic and hear what the patient tells you about the episode of abdominal pain. They couldn't have a single normal meal in their lives. In a healthy person, the LPL protein breaks down dietary fat into small particles so it can be used to fuel the body's activities. But about three out of every million people are born with a defective LPL gene. The fat doesn't break down and their blood becomes so thick it turns white. So it comes out of the body looking like that? Yep. It does come out of the body, but you see it better if you have it standing in a fridge overnight. And then what sits on top looks like cream, white as cream and white as the fridge itself. John Castellan was a young doctor from Amsterdam when he first joined Hayden's team in the late 1980s. Hayden's first assignment for Castellan? To find the gene that makes the LPL protein. It wasn't going to be easy. At the time, the techniques for then finding the gene that belongs to the protein were in its infancy. It took two years, but they found it, using the DNA of a patient who had a severe mutation. We found, indeed, in a gene, a big fault. Actually, a hole. There was a whole hole in the gene. This was a very happy, happy uh, and special a, day. Yeah. Uh, and we a, knew we had something. A good day. Their eureka moment was captured in this photograph. Everybody was uh, really thrilled, thrilled. We knew we had it at that moment. Now that they'd found the defective gene, could they fix it? I have to give all the credit to Michael. He started to think about gene therapy. We know they've got a defective gene. The one way to treat this would be to replace the gene. I mean, it was a fairly simple concept. But the problem is, how do you deliver that gene? And how do you get it into the blood? They decided to use a harmless virus, specially designed to deliver the new gene into the body. The first tests yeah. were in mice. The stunning results made the cover of this medical journal, showing how day by day, the white, fat-laden blood turned red. That was an amazing moment, and you just saw it. You, when you withdrew blood, and the first, it's like milk. And then you take it a week later, it's lighter. You take it a week later, it's lighter. You take it eight weeks later, and it's completely clear. We've got it. You've, you, you knew you had it then. Then, through sheer luck, the UBC team found the same genetic mutation in a colony of cats from New Zealand. When the drug cured the cats, it was time to test it on humans. But that takes lots of money. It's called the Valley of Death. That moment when a scientific discovery makes the treacherous journey from the lab to the marketplace. That's when the investors, the business experts, and the marketing specialists step in to pay for clinical trials, manufacturing, and licensing costs. It's the only way a scientific discovery ever gets to patients, because universities don't make drugs. So Castellan returned to Amsterdam and formed a drug company to develop the treatment that would be called Glybera. So we took over all the science, the mice science, the cat science, the virus science. Back in Vancouver, Hayden's team continued to provide lab support for the Dutch company. And in Holland, the first clinical trials were an immediate success. Within an hour, all the patients could walk and they never had any side effects at all from the therapy. But to get government approval, they needed more human trials. 
So they return to the one place in the world with the highest prevalence of the disease, and that's here in Canada, along Quebec's Saguenay River. At a special lipid clinic in Chicoutimi, doctors began testing Glybera on LPLD patients who live in the area, where a gene mutation from a single ancestor has been passed down through the generations. Cynthia Turcott's parents both carried the mutation, but they didn't know it until their infant daughter almost died. I was um, eight months old and uh, I had um, some pain and I was vomiting and my mother was very panicking. We saw that on the, in the blood sample there was some part was uh, white, like cream, and was like, oh, and they panicked. They said to my mother, I had 24 hours to live. The doctors saved her life by starving her until her fat levels dropped. But she was told she could never eat chocolate or ice cream or hot dogs or milk and forget about beer or wine and a normal social life. The worst part was when she was told she could never have children. I was uh, in shock. I was grieving. I had to go to, to uh, I'm a psychologist, I had to go to, uh, to psychotherapy to, to deal with it. Then, at 22, she was stricken with a dreaded attack of pancreatitis. When she heard about the clinical trials happening in Chicoutimi, Turcotte immediately volunteered. So I, I said, yeah, I want to go there, I want to have it. Turcotte had no way of knowing then that she would be one of the few patients in the world ever to receive the life-changing drug. Back in Amsterdam, the drug company spent years trying to convince Europe's health regulators to approve it. And there was a lot of fighting and the politics, very unpleasant. Over the years it took to win that approval, the company lost millions. It was liquidated. A new company took over, called Unicure. It partnered with an Italian firm to finally get Glybera on the market. When the drug went on sale, it made headlines. Because not only was it the world's first gene therapy, it had also become the world's most expensive drug. The price? around $1 million for the one-time treatment. Did they tell you how much they were going to charge? No, no. I learned that first from, from he reading about it uh, as it became public. No, I, I didn't know, know what they were going to charge. Back in Vancouver, Hayden was not involved with the new company. He and UBC had signed over their patents long ago and moved on to other research. Hayden would get no money from the sale of Glybera, and he had nothing to do with setting the price. To be quite frank, this was not something I was particularly proud of, uh, that the pricing of this made this out of the reach of patients, the very patients, and the whole motivation for doing this was to have this available for patients. The problem is, is also that people like me and Michael, we never have anything to say about pricing. You know, by the time that there's a pricing, we are, we are gone already because it, we, we've done the science and the clinical work and everything. And then it's the commercial and the financial people who determine the price. Why did Glybera cost so much? A Unicure official told us the million dollar price was based on a business calculation. Because other drugs for rare diseases can cost several hundred thousand dollars a year, every year, for life. By comparison, Glybera, with a one-time cost of a million dollars, seemed reasonable, especially since it was the only drug that could treat LPLD. And for that price, uh, obviously, it was almost impossible to sell it. In the end, there was only one customer. A German doctor prescribed it for this woman. It changed her life and stopped the potentially deadly pancreatitis attacks. With no other customers, Glybera was abandoned last fall. Three remaining doses were given away for the bargain price of one euro each. Added up, the drug was given to only 31 people in the entire world, most treated free in the clinical trials. Cynthia Turcott is thrilled to be one of them. Because of Glybera, she was able to have two healthy children. Unicure officials told us there are no plans to revive Glybera or to apply for license in the U.S. or Canada. I have a hard time understanding why you're not angry that this drug that you developed didn't get used. I think 
I was angry at the time, but because this has taken so long, um, it kind of wears you out in a way. For the scientists, the discovery of Glybera is still a career highlight, an historic Canadian achievement that beat the odds. It did work, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, so the patients that got it are still very happy. But in the harsh reality of the drug business, that's not enough. Kelly Crow, CBC News, Toronto. And up next on The National, we meet a group of researchers using AI to help users learn a new language one conversation at a time. It's still very far from a human, but we can have a, I think we can have a really engaging conversation between the application and the learner. And tomorrow night on The National, the At Issue Gang kicks off 2019 with a look at some of the big political questions for the year ahead, but with a twist. Here's a preview. My question for the at issue panel. This is my question for the at issue panel. My question for the at issue panel is. My question for the at issue panel. My question for the at issue panel is. 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 That's right, we're putting your questions to our panelists, and you all had a whole lot on your mind from surprise ballot box issues to new political parties and threats to Canadian unity. Andrew, Chantal, Paul, and Althea are back for my favorite night of the week. You don't want to miss it. That's tomorrow on The National. We are live on The National and following a reaction this evening to the death of Daryl Dragon, better known as the captain of the 70s pop duo Captain and Tennille. He died of kidney failure early this morning at an Arizona hospice. His former wife and musical partner, Tony Tennille, at his side. Dragon was 76. Six people are dead and more than a dozen others hurt following a train accident in Denmark. It happened early this morning on a bridge linking the country's two main islands. Officials say a passenger train was hit by debris from a passing freight train, which was carrying Carlsberg beer. We don't know why the debris fell, but the bridge had been closed to cars because of high winds. And we're keeping an eye on Apple shares, which tumbled more than 7% in after-hours trading. This followed an announcement by the company saying it expected sales to drop. In a letter to investors, CEO Tim Cook says the problem is China. He says Apple did not foresee, quote, the magnitude of economic deceleration in that country and said rising trade tensions with the U.S. may have contributed to the slowdown. Well, if you've ever tried learning a new language, you know how hard it is just to get the basics down, never mind holding a real conversation. To get to that point, the best way to practice, usually speaking with another human being. But now a group of Toronto researchers is building an app with an artificial intelligence. And as Ron Charles found, it can even understand bad accents. Vous allez uh, parler de vos, de vos habitudes quotidiennes. Language instructor Pierre Gilbert gives his students something they rarely get in downtown Toronto, an opportunity to have casual conversations in French. The students take a break to explain in English why that matters. The grammar is enough to get you by to understand it, but it's the, it's the hearing and the, and the speaking. I think conversation is actually the hardest part of learning a language because I did um, French instruction from like kindergarten all the way up through high school, but speaking I'm so terrified of. We were talking earlier about what to do with the beta tests. That's what's brought together this group of experts in education, artificial intelligence and gaming software. What's it going to look like in terms of the case? They've spent the past the five years developing an app that gets people learning a new language to speak it out loud conversationally. Beverly Bigger came up with the idea after a 30-year career publishing textbooks, many aimed at teaching language. Most people who want to uh, learn a new language want to learn how to speak a new language. They want to um, achieve spontaneous conversation, which is what we're having right now. The app, called Speaks, is set up like a video game where players navigate through a trip to Paris. Hotel Rose, Monsieur, he's addressing you now. The scenarios start out simple enough. Why not try this one on your own? 
Oui, merci, monsieur. But get increasingly more complex as the user meets new characters. Let's see if we can meet some new people. Using speech recognition isn't new to language learning apps. How do you say train station again? But Bigger says most other apps simply have users repeat phrases. Some of our competitors use um, um, technology or speech technology just to have um, their users repeat a sentence, whereas ours is really used to recognize a voice. We, we use technology, number one, to recognize what is being said, and number two, how it's being said. No mercy. Nice. This app uses a form of artificial intelligence to understand the context of even badly accented French. So you have to build a system from the ground up. Sean Robertson put his artificial intelligence graduate work on hold to help make speaks as real as possible. It's still very far from a human, but we can have a, I think we can have a really engaging conversation between the application and the learner. What's next? Where Bigger says that? the application is starting that conversation first in French as a nod to the 50th anniversary of official bilingualism in Canada. A lot of Canadians don't realize that immersion actually was initiated in Canada. And so, um, uh, we uh, integrate a lot of the immersion, the principles of immersion. Bonjour et bienvenue à l'Hôtel Max. Bigger's team has been testing speaks with some keen French learners in Toronto. Bonjour, je m'appelle Rick. Bonjour, je m'appelle Arnaud. They're hoping to get more people speaking Bonjour, the language madame. when they launch the app in January. Bonjour, monsieur. Enchanté. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. Interessa. Up next on The National, one airline giving the passengers the gift of first class. It was actually a costly mistake, but one the airline's still going to honor. Whether it was an actual mistake fair or whether this was, um, you know, uh, an easy way to, to generate some goodwill, I mean, I'm, I'm all for it, Cafe Pacific. <laughs> so what's it like to score one of the more expensive plane tickets out there at the price of economy? Find out in our moment, but first. Writer, comedian, and actor Bob Einstein has died. That's Bob Einstein, also Officer Judy. Einstein got his start alongside the likes of Steve Martin in the writing room of the groundbreaking Smothers Brothers comedy series, where he won the first of his two Emmys. But it was his invention of Super Dave Osborne, the ultra-confident, deadpan, disaster-prone stuntman that catapulted him to fame. You know, I've been a stuntman all my life, and even though I take every precaution necessary, the thing that protects me most is my incredible sense of what's going on around me. To me, the joke was never the hit, even though that's the, the, that isn't what I was looking right. for. I was looking for the absurdity in the whole thing. Michael! The Osborne character was a regular on the Canadian sketch show Bazaar. I spent 12 years here, and I would have been proud to be a Canadian. More recently, he was known for his work as Marty Funkhauser on Curb Your Enthusiasm. And I'm sorry! I'm sorry! I'm so... Who's this? Unspecified health problems kept Einstein from the set of Curb's 10th season. In a tweet, his brother, another comedian, Albert Brooks, said he would be missed forever. He was 76. Everyone loves a bargain, I know I do, but this one almost feels like Skyway robbery. One of the world's top-rated airlines, Cathay Pacific, accidentally sold first-class tickets for a fraction of the real price. Now, travel bloggers spread the word on New Year's Eve that huge deals were being advertised. The airline has fixed the mistake, so it's too late for you, but it's honoring all tickets sold at that deep discount. One lucky traveler is set to fly round trip from Boston to Hong Kong to Hanoi with savings that approach $20,000. His moment of triumph is our moment of the day. The route that I chose was about 1,200. So 1,200 instead of 30,000. Um, I, I did not do well in math, but I believe that's about a 95% savings. I'm excited to check out the lounge. There's a lot of uh, fun and relaxation to be had in Hong Kong. It's kind of like a spa in the middle of a hotel. There's apparently some caviar involved. I've never been a fan of, but I mean, hey, if they're gonna serve it to you, 
man, why not? So I travel a lot for work. Um, I work for a, a, a tech company and uh, go to a lot of conferences. I travel and coach a lot, which uh, I'm I'm fine with. I, I think this is going to be about as far out of the ordinary as I can imagine. In terms of travel experiences on the bucket list, this was pretty high up there for me. You know, whether it was an actual mistake fair or whether this was, um, you know, uh, an easy way to to generate some goodwill. I mean, I'm, I'm all for it, Cafe Pacific. Ooh-wee, that looks uh, pretty nice. It, it, it is a little weird though, right? Like, uh, funny how this company does seem to make these high profile gaffes. This is the same uh, company that misspelled, happened to misspell its own name on its own plane <laughs> and then tweeted about it, you know, forgetting the F in Pacific. Uh, so, but hey, it gets people's attention, right? Yeah, and I was going to mention all the food, but he mentioned all of it. And I'm just going to say, once you travel that way, how do you go back then? How would you go back to coach? I wouldn't be able to do it. And, and let me ward off uh, the cynical tweets that people may be in the process of writing. We, we don't fly business class, so we are as delighted as everybody else uh, with this story. <laughs> but I'm here until uh, 2 a.m. Eastern, 11 p.m. Pacific. I will be looking through some uh, ads to see if there are any mistaken fares tonight. I admit, uh, I'll be okay, can that. you let me know if you find anything? <laughs> Absolutely. <We'll be> up. <laughs> that is The National for January 2nd. Good night. Good night. Good night.